Our scripture reading today is the Gospel of John, chapter 10. John, chapter 10, verses 7 through 10. Today is the uh, first Sunday in Advent. And our theme for this year as we focus on Christ is God's grace to us. God's grace to us. We'll be looking at an aspect of God's grace each Lord's Day uh, up through the 20th of December. Today we're going to be looking at being made in the image of God. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? And how is God's grace shown to us in being made in his image? And so we look at the gospel of John chapter 10 verses 7 through 10, as Jesus is teaching on life and what life is really about and what life really is. So let's pray before we have our study. Father in heaven, we praise your holy and majestic name for this time of worship to honor your holy and majestic name. And now we come to a time to study your word. And I pray, Father, that you will keep the evil one from us, help us to focus on your word, teach us by your Holy Spirit, and give us understanding of your word and what it means to us today and how it would impact our lives as you apply it by your spirit. So continue to bless us with your presence. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Shall we stand for the reading of God's holy word, verses 7 through 10. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we're looking at God's grace being made in the image of God. Jesus is teaching here that he came to give life and to give it more abundantly. So we need to look at two words, abundantly and life. What is that? When we look at the word abundantly, it means more than enough, having way more than enough, like Thanksgiving dinner, right? Yeah, you still have turkey in your refrigerator? Bring it tonight for the covered dish. Or whatever you want to bring. It's an abundance, an abundance of life. Now, abundant may also mean quantity or quality. Quantity or quality. So Jesus came to give us an a quantity of life. It's eternal life. You're going to live forever. Do you realize that? You know, you worried about being 90 to 100 years old. How about two or 3,000 and you're just a teenager? An eternal life. Longevity. You and I have it in Christ. Does a non-believer live for eternity? Yes. Where? It's okay, you can say hell in the Presbyterian church. In hell, as an object of the wrath of God. That's pretty serious that somebody's, millions of people are going to be in hell because they did not believe in the only Son of God. So yeah, there's an eternal life, there's a, a longevity, a quantity of life in hell with the wrath of God abiding on those people. 
Jesus said, I've come to give life more abundantly. And there's the, not only the quantitative of eternal life, but there's the qualitative. Where will the believer spend eternity? Heaven. Heaven. All right. Man, y'all still suffering from Thursday, aren't you? Heaven. What's heaven like? Read Revelation chapters 21 and 22. Don't read it now. Read it this afternoon. Oh, it's an awesome place in the very presence of God. No more sin. No more sorrow. No more tears. No more pain or suffering. Anybody want to go? I can tell you how to get there. It's only through Christ alone. It's only in Christ that you have eternal life. Trusting in him. And him alone for your salvation. There's where you and I will have eternal life. Even though we possess it now. But we will experience it personally at our death. So how does the grace of God play into all this? Well, we need to go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. So if you turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to see the grace of God. And I think, I honestly believe the grace of God is shown to us in Genesis 1.1. I always like to start with Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. In the beginning, Elohim created. He didn't form a committee. It would have never gotten done. In the beginning, God is sovereign, God is omnipotent, God is in charge. And that's his grace. That he and he alone is in charge of everything. Now go to verses 26 and 27 of this same chapter. After God has created all things... Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then in verse 28, he said, and God blessed them and we'll stop there. But we're created in the image of God. Now the big theological question is what in the world does that mean? And I'm not even going to get into it today to the depths that you might want to. Other than to send you to John chapter 4 where Jesus is talking to the woman of Sychar and they got in a debate over where do you worship? The Samaritans say you worship on this mountain. The Jews say you worship here. And Jesus said, God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So God is spirit. He's spiritual. He doesn't have a body like you and I have. So the image of God in man is primarily spiritual. Now look at Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. And look at verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. God created man out of dust. Now the word man here in the Hebrew, Adam, is mankind. So he created mankind out of the dust. So God has formed this body and it's lying there and there's no life in it. It's just a body. It's not moving. It's dead. There is no life. And God breathed into the man. And he became a living creature. Creature is not the right translation of the word, of the Hebrew word, nefesh. It's soul. 
man became a living soul. And God breathed directly into man life, spiritual life. And the life that you and I live is spiritually based. It's not temporal. We live in a temporal materialistic world that God created for us to honor him in and to enjoy. But when you and I look at the essence of life, it's spiritual. It is from God. Calvin says that the the essence of our life is breathed directly to us from God. So our life is the breath of God. God did not breathe into any other creature this breath. He only breathed his breath into mankind. We're the only ones made in the image of God. The animals are not. And so we live by the very breath of God created in his image. That's grace. He didn't have to do that. He could have made us something else. But he didn't. He made us in his image. Why would he want to make us in his image? Look at Genesis chapter 3. Verse 8. Now the fall has taken place here, but I want us to look at this verse. And they... That is, Adam and the woman heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. That's why he made us in his image. To love us. To have a relationship with us. To provide for us. And we in turn would honor and love him. It's a fellowship. It is a fellowship with God. That's His grace. That's His grace to fellowship with God, to commune with God day in and day out. Now, in this context, it's really sad that they heard the voice of the Lord. God walking in the cool of the day and you read the rest of it as they ran and hid from him but before the fall they ran to him and there was genuine fellowship and communion and communication and love between God and the ones he had created in his image and that's why we're created in the image of God Now, we know what happens next. That life was lost. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. As God was given instructions to Adam concerning how to live before God. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may eat, surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. God warned the man, you've got everything in here you can eat, but this one tree, it's a knowledge Of good and evil, you cannot eat it because you will die when you eat from that tree. So Adam understood completely. And God was being gracious to Adam by warning him, don't do this. Don't do this. Now let's look at chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. The serpent is talking to the woman. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes 
and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. They lost that spiritual life. It said that their eyes were open. So this, this death that came was not physical. It was spiritual. It was a spiritual death. Their eyes were open. Now they know evil as well as good. So they died spiritually. And all of mankind died because... Adam's name in the Hebrew meaning mankind, he was the federal head and he went down, we all went down with him. And so that life, that spiritual life was killed. Now, let's look at the result of this fall. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. What happened to this fellowship and this communion and this oneness with God that had to be so meaningful, so special? What happened in Genesis chapter 3, verses 23 and 24? This is after God has cursed the serpent, the woman, Adam, and creation. Now look what God says. Well, let's look at 22. Then the Lord God said, behold, a man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. God saw that if man eats from the tree of life in a sinful condition, he would be eternally condemned. And so God, you got two verbs here in the Hebrew. He sent them out. This word to send is a strong word. And basically he says, get out now. Move it. To drive out is another strong Hebrew verb. And it literally means to take by the nap of the neck and the seat of the pants and throw. And he threw them out of his presence. God is holy, holy, holy. Just as we have sung this morning. God does not tolerate sin in his presence. He doesn't allow it in his presence. He has absolutely nothing to do with that. And we have a very graphic picture of the results of the fall by being alienated from God out of his presence. Every person from that point in time to the second coming of Christ who does not have Jesus Christ as their savior is not allowed into the presence of God. Neither does God listen to them. That's a result of the fall of mankind. Now, the gracious part in this is found in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And you can say, how can there be grace in this? Oh, there is. Look at Genesis 3, 15. God telling them, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, at this point in time and in this context, and this is why we need to be uh, biblical theologians because we stay in the context. The only thing 
that uh, Adam and the woman knew is that someday that there would be a child of theirs that would kill that snake. And it would have dominion over that snake. We know what that literally means today because we have the full revelation of God. This is the first promise of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the first promise of the Messiah. And the Messiah was going to have victory over the serpent, over Satan. And that victory has been accomplished when Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross and died for your sin and mine and was raised from the dead. That has been accomplished. God made that promise. And God has fulfilled that promise. This is grace. Because God could have said, that's it. Done. He could have done that. But he didn't. He reached out in grace to his people that were created in his image to restore that life. And this is what God did. Now, look at verse 21 of chapter 3. You remember that as soon as there was rebellion against God and Adam and the woman knew that they were naked, they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves, themselves because they were shameful of their sinful act. Look at verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothe them. That's grace. Notice God covered the sins. God covered the naked body. And how did he do it? With the animal giving its life. Its blood was shed. Its life was poured out. And the skins covered the body. This would point again to the crucifixion of Christ. And notice God provided it. They didn't go to him and say, hey, these fig leaves aren't getting it. You got anything better? No, they didn't. They were spiritually dead. They didn't know what to do. And God was gracious to cover them and to keep them in his presence. Now, let's turn to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. In Genesis 6, 5, we see the, the continued deterioration spiritually of mankind. In Genesis 6, 5, look at these words. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is God's evaluation of mankind. After the fall, after they were kicked out of the garden, they continued to multiply and fill the earth. The sin of man just multiplied. Cain being, uh, killing his brother Abel, murder just went on until you get here to Genesis 6, 5. And God sees it, that the thought and intent of the man is evil continually. And now you know the rest of the story. 2015. ISIS. Murders in this city. On a daily basis, it seems. People being robbed and raped. People being taken advantage of. It's all over the place. The sinfulness of mankind... Just go home and read your paper. Just turn on the news. Google it. You'll see it. You'll see that every thought and intent of the a mind of God, of the man, is evil. And yet God is long-suffering. How many of us would put up with this mess? How many of us would put up with anybody like that? We wouldn't. We wouldn't do it. And yet God is so gracious and God has a plan of his eternal decree and it's working out every day. But someday it's going to come to an end. It is going to come to an end. And are we telling the gospel of Jesus Christ 
to the people we interact with on a daily basis, to family, to friends, to neighbors, to the stores we go into. When God brings people into our lives who don't know Christ, do we think about a conversation about Jesus or even just mentioning Jesus to get them thinking? So this is a spiritual condition of mankind. Now, we go to John 3.16. There's a lot happens between this and John 3.16. And everybody knows John 3.16. It was in our responsive reading this morning. Remember the promise of God in Genesis 3.15. Now we're at John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God fulfilled that promise. He fulfilled that promise of life in Christ. The restoration of that spiritual life which allowed his children to be in his presence. All the animal sacrifices pointed to Christ. God was always with his people in the tabernacle, in the temple, and then Christ himself coming and now in our hearts by his spirit. All those years, God's grace to continue to interact with his people and to draw them closer to him. Now I want you to look at John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verses 35 through 40, where Jesus is talking about telling that he is the bread of life. And look at the promise that Jesus gives here. Jesus said to them, I, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And that is going to happen. Anyone in this room that believes in Jesus Christ being the Son of God, dying for your sin and was raised from the dead, and you confess that you believe in Jesus, and you've confessed that you are a sinner, and you've asked for forgiveness and cleansing, and you've repented, Lord, be my Savior, you're trusting in Him. You have eternal life. And at your death and at mine, to be absent from the body, present with the Lord, immediately. That's the hope that we have. That's the grace of God given to us in Christ. A free gift. You and I can't work for this. We can't pay for it. We have to receive it. It's God's grace and God's love and God's gift for you personally. This is what we have. What's the result of this new life that we have in Christ being restored? Turn back to John chapter 3. Turn back to John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Jesus didn't come to condemn. The world was already condemned, but he came to give life 
and everyone who believes in him has that life and you are not condemned and you never will be condemned. Paul says in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. You are not condemned. You will not be condemned in Christ. We've read already John 10, 10. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Now let's go to 1 John. Turn with me to 1 John. Chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. In the first four verses, we've talked about the, the communion and the fellowship that Adam and the woman had in the garden. Look what we have now. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. Now here's the purpose given. So that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. The key word in here is koinonia is fellowship. Christian biblical fellowship is not covered dish suppers. It's not. It's not eating. Koinonia means an intimate relationship that is very personal where we share with one another the deep things of in our lives, the things that we're fearful of, the things that cause us anxiety, the things that worry us, where we can pray for one another. And it will not go anyplace else. That's what it, fellowship with the Lord is. That's what it was like in Genesis 1 and 2. And the first part of chapter 3. And that was destroyed. But it's reestablished in Christ. And you and I have that fellowship with our Savior, Jesus Christ, along with the Father and the Son. And then our fellowship with one another is very strong. But it's centered on Christ. Brothers and sisters, it's not centered on the church. It's centered in Christ and Christ alone. That's grace. That is grace. Then turn to the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. The 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. Look at verses 16 and 17. We're not condemned. Our fellowship is restored with the Lord and with each other. Verses 16 and 17 of John 14. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. This is what you and I have at this very moment. The moment someone prays to receive Christ as Savior, the Spirit of the living God comes right in your heart and will dwell with you through eternity. This is what you and I have. That presence of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And to teach us the Word of God, to help us to remember to empower us to lead a life that's pleasing and honoring to God. That is grace. That is grace. God never lowers his standard. You will be holy for I am holy. That's his standard. And he knew we couldn't do it. So he chose to live within us to enable us 
to live lives that would be pleasing and honoring to him. That's grace being made in the image of God. And then finally in John 14, first six verses. Let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go in the way you know. For I, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes under the Father but by me. Look at the personal pronouns in this passage. I will come to you. I will receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you will be also. You know what I think is so special about Thanksgiving? You know what's so special about Thanksgiving? There are no gifts. There's no worry and rushing to buy this and that. And you sit down at a, at a nice big dining room table with family and possibly some friends. And there are no phones. And we actually talk to each other. Right? Good amen over there. How about in here? And I've heard testimonies from you today. How was your Thanksgiving? Oh, it was great. Family, we had some friends. We sat around and talked. I rest my case. That's what heaven's going to be like. Only there won't be any politics or football to mess up the conversation. Just about the Lord and his honor and his love and his mercy. That's grace. That's it. The image of God in us. When he could have snuffed out the, the mankind. But his grace said no. But he is a holy, a just, and a righteous God. He will not turn his back on sin. And that's why there is the wrath of God against all ungodliness. And it will come. And it will hit. And it will last for eternity. That's because God is holy and just and righteous. Aren't you thankful that he's long-suffering and gracious, full of lo loving kindness and tender mercies? That's being made in the image of God. Do you have that image of God restored in you? Are you a believer in Jesus Christ? I'm not asking to be Presbyterian. I don't care who baptized you. I don't care what this religious stuff. Think about Christ. Do you know Jesus Christ as Savior? If you do... That spiritual image is restored and you have all these promises. If you don't, you're looking at the wrath of God abiding on you eternally. Won't you come to Christ? Experience his forgiveness, his love, his mercy, and his grace. And you will experience the rest of your life. Think about this. It's very serious. Come to Christ. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, thank you so much for your grace. It made us, you made us in your image. And when that spiritual life was destroyed in us, you came with the promise of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come into the world to have victory over Satan and death and separate us from sin. And that, that promise has been fulfilled when the Lord Jesus Christ was born into this world, 
when he was crucified, when he died and was buried and was raised from the dead. And we experience your grace and mercy in Christ every day we live. Thank you, Father, for that. I pray for those here today who do not know Jesus as Savior. Oh, how I pray that you'll move in their hearts by your spirit, that you'll flood them with your love and your grace and mercy, that they'll come to know Christ as Savior. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.